The 7900 XT has been out for quite a few months now, and while it wasn't that well received at launch, it has seen the price of custom AIB cards fall a little more into alignment, making it a perfect time to take a look at the Sapphire 7900 XT Pulse, which is probably the go-to kind of brand and model that you think of when you start thinking about AMD graphics cards. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Look at the size of this mid-tower gaming case. With three pre-installed fans that provide massive airflow and plenty of space for up to nine fans in total. Along with PWM functionality, you can tweak things to strike the balance between cooling and silence. A built-in Type-C 3.2 Gen 2 port provides transfer speeds of up to 10 gigabits per second too. And it supports dual CPU motherboards with a width of up to 330 millimeters, as well as support for vertical mounted GPUs and space for two 360 mil radiators. It really does have so many cool features. If you like what you see, check out the link in the description to find out more. While the AMD Reference 7900 XT is a fine looking and performing card when it comes to not only the performance, but also in terms of how the cooler holds up, I'm more hopeful for the Sapphire Pulse card as it should offer a better proposition when it comes to thermals and of course overclocking. Now in terms of the design, it's nothing out of the ordinary with a pretty much full black design with some red accents throughout, which may put some people off, but for me, it works and also ties in with the fact that it's an AMD card, so it's kind of what you'd expect. The three large fans include a pretty unique angular velocity blade design, and in typical fashion, the outer two fans spin the opposite way to the middle to reduce turbulence and to give you the very best cooling performance, which will be something that we look at a little later on. There's some simple pulse branding on the fans along with a brushed metal plate along the top with the Sapphire logo on, just to kind of break up the design a little. Around the rear is where we find the full black backplate, again with some red accents and more pulse branding, just to separate things up a little. And in a turn up for the books, the 7900 XT Pulse includes no RGB whatsoever, which should help to bring the cost down as well. It's a fairly large card coming in at 315 millimeters long, 134 millimeters high and 52 millimeters wide. Meaning that while it will take up two slots in your case, the cooler shroud will actually extend beyond that. It's a solid built card. That's kind of pretty plain to see as soon as you take it out of the box. And that's also reflected in the weight coming in at 1,620 grams, which is actually a little lighter than the 1,735 grams that the reference 7900 XT comes in at. But to combat any sag issues, Sapphire do include a PCI expansion bracket arm to hold the card into place, which I much prefer to an afterthought kind of flagpole type stand because they just feel I don't know, a bit generic in the grand scheme of things. There are two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors to provide ample power to the card, something that AMD have prided themselves on having, unlike the 12VH PWR connector that Nvidia cards now have. Around the I.O. we find two HDMI ports and two DisplayPort connectors, which is a little different to the setup found on the reference card, which ditches one of the HDMI ports in favour of a Type-C port, though I think the average user would actually much prefer the layout that Sapphire have gone with anyway. Taking the card apart is pretty simple, with most of the screws held onto the back plate, along with the four screws holding the GPU core onto the main plate of the cooler. With a little force, it can be removed, and another seven screws hold the back plate into place. The cooler is pretty large, with a copper plate that makes direct contact with the GPU core and the memory chips, with six heat pipes that help spread the heat around to the end of the cooler. There's also some metal plates that touch the VRM circuitry and are sandwiched by some thick thermal pads. The backplate, while it's not the thickest, will provide extra cooling and does include three thermal pads to help aid with heat dissipation from the rear of the PCB as well. The PCB is quite large, but typical of an AMD based design with 10 memory ICs surrounding the core. The power setup is a 14 phase monolithic MP87997 design, which are rated for 70 amps each and are all controlled by the monolithic MP2857 controller. While the three phase monolithic MP87997 design, which are also rated for 70 amps each, are all controlled by the monolithic MP2856 controller for the memory. A pretty standard setup that we have seen on other AMD 7900 XT cards before, and pretty typical of what you'd expect. 
In terms of clock speed, Sapphire have beefed things up a little bit with a core clock increase of 75 megahertz over the reference spec. Now sitting at 2075 megahertz and a boost clock of 2450, a small 50 megahertz over the reference spec. But they have kept the memory at the same 2500 megahertz or 20 gigabit per second effective. So a good looking card with a lot of the right stuff under the hood, but how does it perform? Well, to test, we put the card onto our GPU test system consisting of an Intel Core i9-12900K on an ASUS Maximus Z690 Hero motherboard with 32GB of Patriot Viper 6200MHz DDR5 memory. All of our tests were run on Windows 11, and for the most part, we'll be seeing how the Sapphire card compares to the reference 7900 XT from AMD to see if that extra cache is worth the extra performance. So starting things off with Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 and what we can immediately see is that the Sapphire card has a slight edge over the reference card with just under 2% between the cards average and a bigger difference of 4% in the 1% lows in favour of the Pulse card. Next up is Cyberpunk and what we see again is the Sapphire card having a small 3% uplift in performance when compared to the reference 7900 XT in the averages and then a slightly higher 4% margin in the 1% lows. Moving on to our next game, Death Stranding, and here, oddly, we see the reference card actually taking a leap in performance, with a 4% lead over the Sapphire card that was previously on top in the averages, along with a 7% difference in the 1% lows. The final game here is Watch Dogs Legion, and in our averages, it was actually the most consistent, with just one frame separating the cards in the averages in favor of the AMD reference card, as well as a 6% uplift in the 1% lows. So in terms of performance, it was close and can be argued as a tie between the Sapphire Pulse card and the AMD reference card. And that's not really through any fault of Sapphire. GPUs these days don't really give much more in terms of performance from card to card at their stock rated levels. Instead, the main reason for buying a custom AIB card comes down to the cooler and the performance that that can give in terms of temperatures, along with fan speed, which equates to noise and maximum power draw. That's where we ran the Pulse card for an hour long loop in F122 at 4K to see exactly how things behaved. And it's here that we saw things were pretty under control with a GPU temperature of 65 degrees while the GPU's hotspot rose to 79 degrees along with the memory peaking at 86 degrees. The fan speed also remained pretty low at 1452 RPM meaning that it was barely audible throughout all while consuming 318 watts of power draw for the card. So some pretty solid numbers, and with stock performance out of the way, the next logical step is to overclock it and see whether it's worth kind of doing in the search for a bit of free performance. After upping the power limit to 115%, we set to work and managed to increase the maximum boost slider from 2680 megahertz up to 3100 megahertz, along with the memory clock, which was also increased from 2500 megahertz up to 2800 megahertz. With our card now overclocked, it's time to see if our efforts were worthwhile by booting up our four games and running the same test to see how our overclock compares to the stock performance and also to the overclock we managed to achieve on the reference card. Starting with Call of Duty, once again, we see an immediate increase in FPS in our average as we go up to 109 FPS after overclocking, giving us nearly 5% extra performance, though the 1% lows only increased by around 2%. This meant that the reference card remained slightly under the performance of the Pulse card with just one FPS between them. Cyberpunk was next and in our averages we saw a very slight single frame per second improvement to our performance making it a 1.5% improvement to the average with our 1% lows actually taking a hit of about 4%. Compared to the AMD reference card, it again sat just behind our overclocked Pulse card, but saw a 9% improvement in the 1% lows. Moving on to Death Stranding, and we find that even though the Pulse gains almost 5% extra performance from our overclock, still wasn't enough to fend off the AMD reference card, which sat slightly ahead in the averages by 1%, which could be deemed as margin of error, though seeing the Pulse card sitting 7% lower in the 1% lows doesn't exactly look great for Sapphire. Our final game is Watch Dogs Legion and overclocking actually brought the performance of the two cards to identical levels, both averaging at 89 FPS. But the difference lies in the 1% lows, where we see the AMD card take a small dip down to 68 FPS, while Sapphire's card gains a 9% boost to the FPS, giving us a smoother overall experience and then consequently sitting 4% better than the AMD reference card.
So with our four games tested at our newfound stable overclock achieved, we then went back to F1 to rerun our one hour long stress test so that we can test performance and make sure we're able to play for as long as possible without noticing stability issues or artifacting during gameplay. The first thing we noticed after the overclock was that our GPU was now only running a single degree hotter, while our hotspot saw a small two degree increase, along with the memory which stayed at the same 86 degrees. None of these figures were particularly surprising as the fan speed did ramp up from 1452 RPM up to 1697 RPM in a bid to work overtime to keep the components cool, but still remained fairly inaudible. The power draw also increased by 15%, now sitting at 366 watts, which makes for an interesting comparison when looking at the reference card. What we found with the Sapphire Pulse was that it runs a little hotter than the reference card in both the GPU and hotspot temperatures, while the memory remains a few degrees lower. In terms of the fan speed, it was much lower than the reference card, even when comparing the overclock results on the Pulse card to the stock results on the AMD card but power was a bit of a sticking point as it's now sitting 18% higher than the AMD reference card. And honestly, I can't really see why. So I'm torn with this one. I love the Pulse Ranger cards from Sapphire, and while it remained quiet throughout our testing, it had a tough fight against the AMD reference card, which does command a slightly cheaper price of around $50 or so. For me, the design is good, and on paper, things look great, but I just don't feel as though Sapphire have done enough to warrant that extra cash, unless you manage to find one for the same price as an AMD reference card, because nothing really stands out for me in terms of performance or the cooler. Sure, you could argue that the design is better, but how much is that really worth to you? And yeah, it's a shame because I had high hopes for it, but I'm more than aware that AIBs have probably had it harder now than ever to be competitive. And that's for kind of AMD based cards as well as Nvidia because the reference or founders cards are better than they've ever been. So brands like Sapphire are already kind of starting off on the back foot. Couple that with margins that are arguably smaller than they've ever been and what do you have left? I mean, don't get me wrong, the Sapphire 7900 XT Pulse, as far as 7900 XTs go, isn't a bad card. And if you can get one for a cheaper price, you'd be foolish not to get one. But I don't know, beyond that, I'm struggling to find a silver lining, which is a bit of a, it's a real issue for me as I wanted it to be good and I wanted to be able to recommend it to you. But you could argue that there is better and for cheaper and that the extra price premium that's needed to buy this card, well, you may as well just spend a little extra again and get a 7900 XTX card instead, because I've made my thoughts pretty clear about the 7900 XT as a GPU. So there you have it. Hopefully you agree with my thoughts about the Sapphire RX 7900 XT Pulse, and you can see my logic behind while it does a job, it could have maybe done it better. And even a trade-off for slightly faster fan speed, which you know, could bring the temperatures down slightly, is something I'd actually look to entertain. That aside, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, then a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do and want to get a metric ton of goodies, then head on over to our Patreon, where you'll get access to behind the scenes content, exclusive live Q&A sessions, access to our bi-weekly game night, and all that great stuff. The link for all that is down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.